For a long time, I've had this crazy idea of climbing to Mount Everest base camp. I've always wanted to see the Himalayas. When I told Qatar Airways that I'd be gone for a while, they suggested I do a wine tasting up there to see how altitude affected the wines. So I packed up samples of some of the first class wine list and set off for Nepal. I spent a few days in the bustling city of Kathmandu doing last minute preparations. I packed up the wine as safely as I could, got some pills just in case of altitude sickness, and had one last hot shower and a good night's sleep. At the crack of dawn, I took a flight to Lukla, a tiny little village in the foothills of the Himalayas. We landed on a small airstrip hugging the side of a mountain. At over 9,000 feet, the air was already noticeably thin. I met up with an experienced Sherpa from the Peak Freaks expedition team. We checked our equipment one last time and then the two of us set off on a 12 day climb, hoping to make it all the way up to base camp. Some of these bridges are a little dangerous, let me tell you. Sometimes the floorboards are missing. easy that last stretch just about killed me we're at base camp and we're heading to peak freaks expedition camp and i'm gonna spend the night there and pop a couple of corks and do a wine tasting when i got to the peak freaks expedition camp i met some of the most famous sherpas in nepal who had just come down from the summit and looked like they definitely needed a glass of champagne and i'm very very honored in fact to be here with some special men these guys have summited Mount Everest a number of times. Maybe you could just tell us how many times you summited. Seven times. And yourself? <laughs> so two times. Nine, nine times up at Everest. Six times. Unbelievable, guys. Well, these men, I have to say, are superhuman. And uh, in fact, I know they can carry 120 kilos down the mountain, sometimes even up the mountain. That's even heavier than me. A lot of respect for you guys. Thank you. All right. Okay, cheers. Sometimes during the day it was warm and sunny, but at night the temperature plummeted to minus 20. It was hard to sleep because you're lying on a fast moving glacier, plus there's 50% less oxygen in the air, and then there's the sound of avalanches going off all night. But in the morning, which is the perfect time for tasting, it was game on. I know this is a little bit unusual, but here we are. We're gonna do the first professional wine tasting to ever take place here to see how altitude affects the taste of wine. And you know what? Altitude does affect the way wines taste. And we spend quite a lot of time thinking about that when we're gonna choose what wines uh, uh, to list, to buy, basically. I'd assembled a selection of some of the finest wines in the world from Qatar's first class list, some of them costing hundreds of dollars a bottle. Now one thing for sure is that you can't be uh, uh, drinking at this altitude, at least I'm not going to. Uh, why? Because it goes to your head very quickly and uh, it's hard enough to breathe up here, let alone a uh, drink and I think I'll save having a hangover for another day. So here we go, gonna pop the Krug. To me, Krug is the pinnacle of all champagnes. When Joseph Krug founded the house back in 1843, he set out to create the finest sparkling wine in the world, a wine that's in a league of its own. The altitude had made it even more bubbly, almost foaming, but what effect had it had on the aromatics? Lots of intensity. I'm, I'm quite surprised, in fact, how intense that is. Uh, amazing, because usually at high altitude, the intensity of a wine can go down. The Krug also tasted fantastic with gorgeously complex flavors. Next up was a beautiful Premier Cru White Burgundy, but a more delicate fine wine. It doesn't have as much uh, flavor intensity as I remember on the ground, but it's still delicious. It's a little bit more delicate. One of the things when you're selecting wines for service up in the sky is you want something with some richness and some power 
nothing too sharp and acidic. It was time to taste the reds and I had two outstanding wines in front of me, one from Bordeaux and one from Napa Valley. The Bordeaux was from the iconic super second growth of Chateau Ducru Bocayou, a wine that had been ranked by Wine Spectator as best wine in the world and one of my own personal favorites. And that's got some nice intensity. In fact, that's a little bit of a surprise. I can't believe these wines so far are showing so well because they've been bumped around. They have been here resting at base camp for about five days because it takes me five days longer than these guys to get up here. So let's have a taste. Now it is a little cool, as you might expect, but it's still very nice, quite tannic. It's a wine that's gonna age for a long time. It's a little bit of dusty tannins, a little bit of grip, but some beautiful fruit and the, the length goes on. Good one. As expected, the Bordeaux was excellent, but how would it fare against a spectacular boutique Napa Cabernet? A lot more richness and ripeness, so it's much more fruit forward, definitely. Also the tannins though, quite high, nice long length. It's got a combination of power and also elegance, that wine in fact, uh, quite delicious. So both of the reds were first class, but with such a rivalry between Bordeaux and Napa, there had to be a winner. I loved both of them, but the styles were so different. Somebody had to make a decision. This one or this one? This one? You like the Napa Valley Cabernet more? Right, okay, well, cheers, there you go. The jury has spoken. It was time to taste what many people say is the best wine in the world, Chateau de Chem Sauterne. You know, you're never gonna believe this or forgive me for rinsing my glass with a little bit of Chateau de Chem. This goes for about four or five hundred dollars a bottle, a half bottle. They're so fanatical about quality here that they produce less than one glass from each vine and the wines can age for over a hundred years. When you taste it, you'll fall in love. Anyway, it tastes fantastic, huh? Delicious wine, that one. Nice and sweet, but counterbalanced with a nice thread of acidity moving through it. Beautiful long length again, fantastic concentration and uh, just a, a, a gorgeous dessert wine. And look at that, the sun's even coming out for Chateau de Kim. So overall, altitude had only had a slight effect on my tasting of the wines. I learned a few things to keep in mind for the next selection. And also that some members of the Peak Freaks expedition team couldn't say no to sneaking a few glasses. Anyway, it was time to pack up and head home, and after such a grueling trip, I was sure looking forward to my comfy seat on Qatar Airways. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier going down the mountain than coming up.